Hey, uh, welcome to all the attendees. Uh, for this event, where we want to focus on our panelists' experience, uh, we have disabled chat. Please use the Q&A to share questions with us, and we'll try to include them in our conversation. You can also share your questions directly with us using the panelist chat. Uh, and we're gonna start by grounding our discussion in a short history of comics. Challenges from Amy Wright, the chair of the ALA, GNCRT Addressing Comics Bands and Challenges Committee. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started. Um, we are gonna get in a brief history of comic censorship and then we're gonna have a discussion with our panelists. Um, one of our panelists, Tia Moore, is a little late joining. We hope that Tia will join us. Um, we're just trying to figure out if there was some confusion on our end, but we look forward to a great chat once I go through a brief history of comic censorship. So uh, a little bit of background. We are members of the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable addressing comic book bans and challenges committee. So we are the newest committee to be added to the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable. We started in February, 2022. The Roundtable has been an official roundtable in the American Library Association since 2019, officially approved 2018. But as Robin Brenner, who is the um, will be our current president starting in the summer reminded me just recently it's been 20 years that people have been doing stuff with comics in libraries so we're excited to have official status and we're also happy that we can help people be prepared to meet comic book fans and challenges head on because a lot of folks are encountering these in their schools and libraries. One of the things that our committee has tried to do is not only help people be prepared to fight bans and challenges currently, but also give people a little bit of background that maybe they don't have or don't know enough about, about why comic books have been, um, unfortunately, banned and challenged for much longer than we realized. So people may be familiar with 1954. This is sort of a pivotal year in terms of the comic book hysteria. Um, that is a shot of Dr. Frederick Gortham, affectionately known as the boogeyman of comic book hysteria. Uh, this is an actual quote of testimony from Dr. Wortham's testimony during the US Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency in comic books in 1954. Uh, these were also televised live, so if you have a chance to, I urge you to find, there's a bunch of clips on YouTube of Wortham's testimony. Um, some of the clips were included in the 1988 documentary Comic Book Confidential. So there's very strong language in what he's saying. Um, this, again, this is a direct quote from his testimony. I think Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry. They get children much younger. So Wortham was a noted child psychologist and actually argued for a lot of really great things. He argued for school desegregation and Brown versus the Board of Education, but he also believed that comic books caused juvenile delinquency, sexual depravity, and illiteracy. So in his mind, it was a public health problem. So what a lot of folks probably aren't aware of is that Wortham was not alone. So people might know the Senate hearings, Wortham and the Comics Code Authority that was introduced post Senate hearings in 1954. What they might not realize is that Wortham, while a very vocal, notable, <laughs> remembered person in history, um, was not alone. There was actually a large, um, we would call them kind of citizen action groups, so community groups, civic organization, and unfortunately, teachers and librarians involved in the battle against comics before and after 1954. Uh, Dr. Carol Tilly, who is very well known um, for actually disproving a lot of Wortham's research, which was fantastic. This happened within the past 10 years, um, has also noted that in the history of comic book censorship, a lot of librarians were actually big fans of Seduction of the Innocent. So um, in Dr. Tilly's article talking about Wortham's research, she mentions that when Seduction of the Innocent came out, this is actually an ad for Seduction of the Innocent from April, 1954, um, there were blurbs from children's librarians. So this is actually from the head of the Children's Services Department at the Brooklyn Public Library, saying that Wortham's book was a must read for anyone who worked with children. Um, my research focuses a little bit more on what's happening north of the border. Um, many people aren't aware, but Canada actually introduced legislation against comic books in 1949. And one of the Canadian parliamentarians who was active in that, E. Davy Fulton, actually testified in the United States in 1954. And a lot of Americans pointed to a Canadian example to help get comic books um, restricted in the United States. 
this is a group that was actually headed up in Western Canada. So this is a shot from the Calgary Herald, uh, 1955. And these are citizens, uh, prominent citizens, including public librarians, looking at what they call the good and bad of children's literature at the public library. Um, so you may have seen some shots of things like comic book bonfires in which they encourage kids to throw their comic books in a bonfire in exchange for quote unquote good reading. That happened and on a larger scale than a lot of us are aware of. So this is all to say a lot of what we're fighting against is definitely a residual sort of educational stigma against comic books and lingering fears for decades that comic books are somehow can rile up young people or are quote unquote a danger to young people. So this is where we step in. This is number three in our three-part webinar series. If anyone has missed the first two sessions, don't worry. There's recordings and resources online. And each of our webinars, while it's part of the series, is also self-contained. So wherever you are at the challenge journey, we really hope that this has been useful. Today, we're going to talk explicitly after a challenge. So here are some of our bullet points that we want you to keep in mind um, if a challenge happens. And it does happen, and we should be prepared for it to happen. One of the biggest things we want people to do is to update their policies. Um, think about things like, are there other books that might be subject to scrutiny? But also that you can live to library another day. You're not alone in this. Um, we are joined by a comics creator who's gone through a challenge today. So our discussion is really what you can do after a challenge comes, um, how you can also take care of yourself because there's a lot of emotional labor that goes into this and to actually conserve your energy to fight for another day. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and we're, we're going to head back to live discussion. Okay, um, and we just want to remind everybody that talking about experiences during challenges uh, can be difficult and re-traumatizing or traumatic. So we just want to take a moment to remind everybody to take care of themselves. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, uh, as we had said, um, and we also want to recognize that this is a difficult uh, topic for us to talk about, and I appreciate all of the panelists being here to talk with us today and engage in this conversation. Um, and I know that many people have been raising the alarm for years, so I hope this panel will help us continue to take action as a concerted effort of a community of librarians. Uh, so we will start by having each of our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, so if Tina's here and available, uh, we can start with her. My audio cut out. We're going to have Trung, um, if you could introduce yourself to start, and then we'll get over to Tia. Okay, sure. Um, hi, my name is Trung Ling Nguyen. I am a comic book uh, writer and artist. Um, I've released a one graphic novel so far called The Magic Fish, um, and it's been subject to some challenges. Um, and uh, I I'm really happy to be here and chat with everyone about this really important topic. Okay, uh, Tia, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Tia. I am a reference assistant at Bartholomew County Public Library. I am the collection development um, developer and creator for the adult comics, graphic novels, nonfiction, and the adult manga section. And I came under fire with my organization from some wannabe book banners. And we are one of the rare exceptions where instead of uh, the end result being that we pulled the book, we actually won and the book remained on our shelves. And Gabe, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Gabriel Lopez. I'm the research and instruction librarian uh, for the Siltonfus Library at Our Lady of the Lake in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I've been serving on the committee to address bans and challenges uh, for about a year and a half with Amy. Um, I also spearheaded the creation of the comics and graphic novels collection in the library. And I also serve as the selector uh, and collection development specialist. 
And hi everyone, I'm Amy. I'm the current chair of the Addressing Bands and Challenges Committee of the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable. Um, day to day, I took a library sabbatical and I'm actually doing my PhD in history right now, looking at the history of comic censorship, um, both in the US, Canada and transnationally. And yeah, by night, I continue to volunteer my time with the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable. So. Okay, so, uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, okay. So Gabe and I are, are, are co-moderating, so apologies. <laughs> uh, so one of the things is we're framing this discussion uh, around our Addressing Challenges Tools Kit. Uh, specifically for this uh, discussion, we'll be talking about what to do after a challenge. Uh, so we're sharing our Addressing Challenges Toolkit. Uh, we have that link up available in the chat. Uh, and then for additional information, please check out our first and second webinars, uh, what to do before and during. Um, and you can see those online. And um, so each of our panelists have their own experience, uh, point of view and expertise to share. Uh, like all webinars, this conversation is one of many we're, many we're all having, and hopefully we'll offer some resources and tools and insights uh, and ways to address censorship during this national organized wave of comic book banning. Uh, we are not alone, and we know that the majority of people oppose censorship. Uh, so we have a link to an ALA uh, press release uh, that talks about how the majority of voters oppose book bans and have confidence in libraries and librarians. Um, so if you can take a look at that when you get a chance. Uh, and then we can move on to our panel questions. Amy, do you wanna go ahead and take the first one? Yep, sure. Um, so we're gonna start um, this question. We'll start with Tia and then we'll go to Trung. Um, so based, oh, um, based on your experiences, we're just wondering, based on your experiences and background, if you could share a little bit more about your experiences with comic book bans and challenges. So a specific challenge um, that you have gone through, but also any background in terms of what your training was, Tio or Trung, even sort of if you anticipated that Magic Fish was going to be um, subject to scrutiny in terms of bans and challenges. So we'll start with Tia and then we'll go to Trung. So... My experience with book bans is I, when we had Gender Queer Challenge by Maya Kababe, which I know is a very hot book when it comes to the culture war cycle that's going on right now, I actually had no training at all going into that. I was completely thrown into the deep end and I was on the collection development team at the time, but I hadn't been on it for very long. So the only advice anybody really had for me was go by the collection development policy and you have to make a response yes or no and so I used I took their advice and I had to draft up a response to the people who were wanting the materials taken off of the shelves and I basically just made a bullet point checklist from the collection development policy and I hit every single point that was on that list. So I talked about how it was critically acclaimed, I talked about the awards it had, I talked about the patron demand for it and I think my response might have worked a little bit too well because when I did mail it out to those patrons, um, suddenly I got a lot of calls and a lot of response saying that I was a witch and a demon. Um, the people who were trying to pull the book from our shelves was a church in town. They weren't a very pop, they're not a very popular church, but they, as always, even though they are tiny, they are very, very vocal. And going through that experience was like being put through the fire, basically. I, um, I was completely unprepared. And in retrospect, I would have not done a lot of the same things I would have done now. But I think ultimately going by that list was the best thing. And like I said, I think it worked a little bit too well. And after that, um, I just stuck to my guns and 
oddly, you know, when you try to take something away and suddenly a lot more people want to know why it's being taken away. Um, well, we didn't pull the book in the end because I told them no. And in the end, we now, instead of having just the one copy that we had before, we now have six copies of Gender Queer on the shelf and are enjoying very healthy regular circulation. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks so much, for, Tia, for sharing. So, Trung, before The Magic Fish came out, did you have any idea? I mean, Magic Fish, even in preparing for this, you were nominated for Eisner's for Magic Fish. There was a lot of attention. Did you think going into this, it would be challenged? And what were your thoughts before that? I mean, I think as a creator, um, anticipating uh, any kind of like reader feedback is not something that I actively sought out because I like to have a healthy boundary between, you know, my relationship with my work and the reader's relationship to the work. And so I wasn't looking for this sort of thing, but that also left me entirely and completely unprepared for the additional work of being an author of going to speak about the book and then also reacting to its challenges across the country. Um, and I, it's one of those things where I think that I uh, am one of those fortunate authors where the book got enough good press and attention in its, at least in its niche, and then a little bit more broadly later on, um, in order for people to come to its defense. Um, but one of the challenges that I find um, a little bit more daunting is what happens to, you know, debut authors or mid-list authors, authors that don't have a lot of press and a lot of attention, because those books can get pulled very easily because they don't generate a lot of press. And so what happens to authors who might not have such a strong foothold in this in, in this industry and in this environment just yet? Um, and that kind of became my main concern. I think um, for comic books, we're sort of like you mentioned in your slideshow before, I'm sort of accustomed to comic books being banned for all sorts of reasons. And the medium itself tends to be a bit of a hot button issue for educators for a long time. And that seems to be changing quite a lot now. People are starting to advocate for comic books and graphic novels as a means to encourage broader literacy among young readers. And that's really wonderful. But this, this, the breadth of this particular kind of book banning in the midst of a culture war was not something that I had anticipated. And so I had to go back and, I, and think about, okay, what are the contents of my book and how are people approaching the books? And I tried my best to be very careful about it. Um, my book was ostensibly bought as a young adult book, but it's been taught um, and consumed by a lot of middle schoolers because it has a very kind of middle grade uh, lilt to the, the text and to the images. And so because of its accessibility, sometimes it winds up on more um, uh, challenge lists than I anticipate that it would be. And the content of it is honestly quite tame. And so it's one of those things where, okay, so there's not a lot of violence, there's not a lot of objectionable material, there's no sexuality in it. What are the reasons that it's being banned? And oftentimes, um, people will have heard that there are queer themes in it, and that there are discussions about coming out, um, and that the book tackles topics of immigration. And so all of those different things kind of place this book at this interesting vector where I'm never really certain what people's are, intentions are in terms of placing it in the midst of this kind of culture war moment. And ultimately, I'm not sure that it, the specifics matter too, too much because I find that oftentimes people aren't reading the books when they suggest that the books be banned. So my experience is relatively new, but I'm starting to understand that there's not a lot of care put into selecting which books to be challenged there. It's often hearsay and reactionary responses. Uh, thank you. Um, and so one of the things that keeps popping up, including in OIF's most uh, recent research on most banned and challenge list is that most challenges don't come from students. And in all of these discussions, a lot of student voices are missing. Uh, can you speak to your experience, both of you, uh, with youth advocates and with youth groups? Uh, Tia, uh, we'll start with you. So when it comes to youth advocates and youth groups, I am not too familiar with them, unfortunately, because a lot of what I dealt with was adult material and adult collections. However, 
during my book ban, there was also a lot of targets being painted in the teen section as well. So we had multiple bans across uh, different departments that we were looking at. And our teen department, I know, did an amazing job of actually reaching out to the local high schools, which our libraries did have good relationships with. And talking to some of the teachers and especially during banned books week because during when our book ban was happening that was also happening as well kind of sneaking in the materials that were being banned at our local libraries so we had students who would look at that on their list and then perhaps they would hear about what was going on here at at my organization and would kind of piece two and two together without us having to directly intervene. We also had a lot of parents as well who regularly come into our library and we we just spoke to them. We were honest about what was going on. We didn't mince words. And I think that was one of the big game changers when our board meetings, we started to get organized at our board meetings was we had a lot of students who were speaking up. We had a lot of parents of students who were speaking speaking up. We had teachers as well speaking up for us. So I think it's important to use those connections that you probably already have when dealing with book challenges because you can get those voices in. And I think it is extremely important that we do have those voices in because ultimately when you have to think about demographics, Sure, it's okay for us to recommend books and for others who are looking at those materials, but ultimately they cannot see it through a person's eyes who that book is targeted to that. So it's important that we do have those voices there. And it's just a matter of using those connections that you already have to your advantage just to get them. Uh, thank you, Tia. Uh, Trung, do you have any experiences with youth groups? Um, well, I mean, not in terms of advocacy, but the most discussions that I've had about my book have been through school organizations and through classrooms. The book is a part of a lot of curricula from middle school all the way up through colleges. And so I've been able to talk to a lot of, uh, you know, very young readers across the spectrum about the book um, in a lot of different ways. And so it always um, astonishes me that there seems to be such little faith um, that these book banners seem to have in the capacity of their young readers to access materials in a meaningful way. And I think that that really is the point. It's not that um, young readers are unable to advocate for themselves. It's more that the, the option is sort of being taken away from them. And I'm not sure that I have too much more to add in sort of a formal way about um, how, you know, how young advocates and young readers might be able to get around some of these things, because certainly there's uh, a lot less agency over the sort of access that they have. And so public libraries become a really important nexus point for them to be able to access materials that they might need. Um, so I, it, it, it's, it's such a range of reactions for me from, you know, being discussed in the classroom and then also being on challenge book lists as well as a sort of a, a strange place to be. No, and I think um, all of your feedback from this question and the one before really talk about some of the things we couldn't have prepared for and some of the things that we're learning as we go. In terms of putting together the committee, one of the things that we had started to do even before we built our toolkit is we surveyed over 150 different libraries and we asked them, do you have a challenge policy? What's your collection development policy look like? And one of the things that really came out is about 55 of our 55 percent of our survey respondents don't have a separate challenge policy, so separate from the collection development policy. And most don't actually have something in their collection development policy that speaks specifically to collecting comics and graphic novels. So for our next question, I was just wondering, and Trung, if you don't mind, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Tia. I was just wondering if you can speak in terms of the challenges to comics and graphic novels, what are some things that you think we need to be prepared for in terms of the challenges to graphic novels that are different than text only books? And what about the visuals of comics and that can require different ways of thinking through challenges and how to defend against them? This could also be what is the awesome thing about comics? Like, why is it that we love them so much too? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll start with, you know, what makes comics great is that they're very accessible. Um, they, they do encourage 
younger readers who might be reluctant readers. They encourage adults who are reluctant readers to get into the, into the habit of cracking open a book and thumbing through the pages and starting to develop a positive relationship with reading. We live in such an age where we're inundated with information all the time that, it, that even if you're a very advanced reader, it becomes really difficult to foster a positive relationship with literacy and comics sometimes really helps facilitate that positive relationship again. And so I always find that to be really encouraging and enlivening. Um, as someone who both writes and draws comic books, it takes a very long time to make them and I do not mind how quickly readers get through them because comic books are really wonderful in that they're both there for reluctant readers and maybe newer readers to sort of develop those skills or foster a more positive relationship with reading, but they're also endlessly rereadable for people who, you know, really are advanced and dedicated readers. And so having that level of accessibility is something that makes comics uniquely positive for, for readers of all stripes. But that also, I think, contributes to the complicated ways that people try to access and then sort of ban them as well, because it's very easy to open up a comic book and sort of pick and choose images um, out of context. It's much faster to do that, I think, with a lot of prose books. Even if there are, if even if they are for younger readers, it takes a little bit more dedication to really, you know, page through and read it and make sure that you, you know, you know what you're talking about in terms of, you know, what you find objectionable about this book, whereas comic books are a little bit faster to go through and you can sort of pick and choose. And comic books being what they are, like a combination of words and pictures, those two things are not discrete. The pictures are a part of the text. And so the ways that people challenge comic books oftentimes conflate them with visual media, with no literary um, kind of um, uh, perspective on them whatsoever, which is very interesting. It seems to, in a lot of people's minds, bear a stronger relationship to television or to you know film and media that we might consider to be entertainment. And so it's, it's a lot easier for folks to feel reluctant to come to the defense of comic books and graphic novels just based on its conflation with, um, with, with pleasure and with entertainment as opposed to something with a lot of intellectual merit. And that's something that, you know, I'm finding is changing quite a lot, but that seems to be the stepping stone. That seems to be the reason why comics are so easy to get on these band lists. 100%. I think the emotional resonance of comics makes them so powerful on multiple fronts. Um, so Tia, we're going to go to you. Why do you think comics are so, so banned and challenged in terms of the positives? What is the great thing that so resonates, but also how can we help prevent against that in terms of building out our policies? So just like what Trung said, I believe that comics are an amazing way for reluctant readers to get back into reading or even for those who are more visual learners to learn in a capacity that would not otherwise be possible in a, in a traditional prose medium. However, I think one of the reasons why it is targeted so much is because lots of people still hold comic books and traditional literary prose to these two different standards when really that needs to stop and now now thankfully a lot of libraries are starting to recognize themselves that both are valid mediums in their own right however when for example we look at art when we see a painting and we see a sculpture we don't hold those two we don't hold those to two different standards, we hold them to the same medium of art. So I believe, just like what Trung said, it, a lot of people hold comics to a different standard because they are easier to get into. So the, you can flip through, cherry pick certain images, and then out of context, say, this is violent, this is pornography. Whereas with a book, you kind of have to pay a little bit more closer attention to sit down and properly go through the book to hand pick quotes and again I do believe that it's really time that we stopped holding comics and regulatory fiction to these different standards because a lot of what you find in comic books you can find in regular fiction or in certain cases you can find more adult things in regular fiction than you can in comics and 
I believe that is one of the things that when my, when I was going through my challenge kept me going was I kept asking myself, is this worse than, have I seen this anywhere else? Is this worse than Game of Thrones? Have I seen this in Outlander? And really just asking those questions can be very helpful, especially when determining whether or not to pull something, because ultimately there probably isn't anything you're going to find in those books that isn't already in the regular adult fiction and if you apply the same arguments that a lot of the banners want to these comics you would have to pull over half of adult fiction as well <laughs> no that's a very good point i often find it you know we have what the beauty of a public library is you can take out a lot of stuff and so there's such a scrutiny around well we don't want kids to encounter that and i mean we have a lot of very salacious romance titles on our shelves and, you know, <laughs> other multimedia. And I mean, a lot of people learn from the public library in a variety of ways. Um, but I think we're going to move over to some individual questions. So I'm going to have, head it back over to Gabe. Uh, Trent, this one's for you. Uh, why comics? Uh, what is it about this visual medium that compelled you to tell your stories through words and pictures uh, versus going only text only? And what do you see as some great strengths of comics uh, that some people might still be overlooking? Sure. Um, well, I think we are sort of in a, a new golden age of graphic novels right now. There are so many titles that I am, you know, just surprised and astonished to learn that kids are able to read and discuss in classrooms now. And that was never a thing, even for me when I was growing up and going to school. Um, and so it's always delightful to sort of know and understand that there seems to be this cultural shift in how we understand comic books and graphic novels and its place in both the popular imagination and also in the classroom. And so that's been really wonderful. Um, for me, uh, I, I don't, really see myself telling stories any other way. I'm a, I'm a first and a half generation immigrant. And so I learned English alongside my parents who immigrated here. And I was, you know, born in a refugee camp. And so I came over with them. And so we learned English at around the same time. And our access to literacy was facilitated by the public library. And we read books together. We, we, we wound up reading a lot of picture books together because that was a way for us to kind of like help shore up our literary skills, but also kind of um, figure out and how to position ourselves in this new environment. And so I've always had this really strong soft spot for, you know, the use of images in literature in general. And comic books are an entirely different thing. I, I didn't really appreciate uh, the ways that comic books are unique and different from both prose books and from illustrated prose books until I started really working in them and understanding that comics are both the words and the pictures together, the text. And I think that's really wonderful. It's a medium that doesn't condescend to its readers. It's something that is intended to bring people along with them. And I think that that sort of compassionate take that's you know, sort of endemic to a medium is something that really attracts me to comic books as someone who learned English second and who used images to facilitate meaning between, you know, a text and myself and understanding that that is a way that you can make a world much more accessible to a broader readership. Comic books are the place where I landed, where I, where I wanted to tell all of my stories. I love the, the ways that um, the images and the, um, and the text kind of work together. I like thinking about, you know, a block of text as taking up a certain amount of visual space because it helps the reader develop a sense of appreciation for the pacing of how they like to read both prose and comic books. And so there are a variety of reasons why comic books become this really lovely space for people to sort of experience things about themselves. And this isn't ex exactly exclusive to comic books either, but I love the book medium in general because it's a it's a work of art that requires constant permission. I, I have a lot of trust in young readers to identify whether or not they're ready for a text. Like it's not really like complaints don't tend to come from younger readers because if they pick up something and they're not ready for it, they put it down and they find something else and they'll come back to it later if they're interested and or if they feel like they're ready for it. And I know that about young readers. Um, and comic books are are really wonderful because it's quite upfront about that. But being able to have this medium that that requires constant permission where you can put it down when you're not ready for it and you can open it up when you are is such a wonderful thing. You get to control the timing of it in that way. And that's not something that's really proffered in any other kind of artistic medium that is narrative this way. So, so comics are very special to me for that reason. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, this next question we'll give out to Tia. Uh, Tia, in your experiences, what are some of the biggest impediments to the library profession and meeting challenges? And what could we do differently? Uh, do you think if, is it more workshops, changing policies? Um, and as a follow-up, what are some of the most proactive things you have seen in schools and libraries to meet challenges? So one of the things I think is one of the biggest obstacles for libraries is not preparing their part-time staff because even though yes a lot of full-time staff typically hold more powerful positions part-timers are kind of like your frontliners in a way it's not generally the people who are high up in the offices who are going to hear about the book bans first it's going to be the people working on the front desk it's going to be your shelvers it's going to be the reference desk and one of the biggest things to our advantage, I think that we did was we did educate all part-time staff eventually after this happened with me. Um, but with our shelvers, for example, we had certain people and they would try to cherry pick books from certain sections and say they found them in other sections. So they would take stuff from my section, which is the adult manga section, for example. And then they would go over to the front desk and they would say, hey, I found this in teen. This isn't appropriate. What was it doing in teen? And the shelvers would take one look at it and they would say, you didn't find this in teen you took this from the adult fiction manga section and when they would respond they would point out that our manga so our adult collections and our teen collections have two different spine labels and obviously the people who are going to know those labels the best are going to be your shelvers so those shelvers would then be able to say no, you didn't find this in this section unless it was by mistake, which we don't have any trainees here at the moment. So that's highly unlikely. Not saying it couldn't happen, but unless another patron set it down and they could have been, you know, doing whatever there. And one of the most proactive things I've seen other libraries do, and I think this is genius, honestly, is they are starting to implement policies where once a material is challenged, that material cannot be challenged again for another two years. And this depends on how sometimes if a if five challenges get handed in for a book example and the policy um, outcome was no, then sometimes you can have that threshold there or sometimes with smaller libraries it can just be one and because of the fact that you are implementing this cool down period it kind of gives the cycle a chance to move on or at least give a bit of a cool down period and the reason why a lot of the cool down periods are so long is because they are the more frequently challenged books so again this would be genderqueer this would be um speak this would be the books that are frequent targets this is a very good policy of prevention in the future for that and typically when it comes to these cultural cycle itself you know not a lot of people are going to be focused on one book from 2018 for example they're going to be more focused on what's new what's coming out No, um, I, sh I should say too, um, both of you actually totally are bringing up parts that we talk about in the toolkit, which is we've heard a lot of people say comics are amazing for all readers and this is why we need to protect against comics. And also the fact that we need to ensure all members of the library in school actually are aware of that. Um, one of our panelists in our second webinar has a series of talking points that they keep at every single public service desk so that when people come in with questions and the questions could even be sometimes they start with, well, I don't know about comic books. So there's advocacy stuff there, but even also how to deal with bans and challenges. And we are seeing thankfully a lot of libraries um, as a very proactive thing after a challenge implement a cooling off period so that somebody cannot challenge something again. So i.e. no, no double jeopardy, you can't. <laughs> um, 
So we're gonna do a few more individual questions and then we're gonna take some questions from our audience. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left in the webinar. So we wanna do a little bit more discussion and then hear from you all if you have questions. So this can be general questions about comic book bands and challenges um, to hear a little bit more about the work Trung and Tia are doing or if it's questions specifically about how to deal with comic book fans and challenges, we are here for all these questions. Um, so Trung, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, but I wouldn't, if you could talk a little bit more about how these challenges have impacted people's reactions of the magic fish, and do you think it's reached more readers or has it actually ended up reaching expanded audiences? Um. Well, I mean, I, I find this to be always to be uh, such a tricky question because I think in my specific case, it has reached a broader audience because more attention has been brought to it. But that really isn't the case for most books that get banned because especially as Tiva brought up, a lot of these organized efforts to ban books are banning newer books. They're looking for the next thing. And that adversely impacts the careers of a lot of newer authors in significant ways. Like we know that, you know, requesting books from the library is a fantastic way to support authors and for authors to kind of be kneecapped at that stage in their careers is really, um, is really kind of tragic because that's something that it, it affects the industry and the diversity of voices and authors across the entire spectrum of writers and creators. And so starting from there, that's also, I mean, it's it sounds like not a huge deal when you talk about it in terms, of, like if you're talking to an author with, you know, with a book that has gotten some attention, you can be like, yeah, like this has actually, you know, gotten my sales up. And then people can be like, oh, it's Streisand affecting. And so people are paying more attention to it. And isn't that good for you? And the answer is always no, no, it's not good for, for authors at large because I'm not the only author that's affected and it's going to affect different authors at different levels of visibility differently than it would affect me particularly. And so I don't like to talk about it in the context of just my book. It has to be a conversation that really uplifts all authors. And so I try to kind of bring it back to other authors as well whenever I'm faced with that question, which does come up a lot. Um, and one of the other things is, of course, that um, I, I think we oftentimes, like authors are tempted to think of librarians as sort of the, the vanguards of library books, and they are to a great extent, but librarians can also be quite vulnerable in certain areas too. If, you, if you're living in a space that does not have a lot of public support for the library in general, oftentimes if, a, if they successfully defend a book in an area um, that is not very supportive of their public library, they can start to pull funds from the public library as well. And so it becomes this sort of interesting thing where authors really do have to do their best to advocate for their public libraries, both as citizens and as professionals. Um, we can't rely on librarians and on teachers to be our support because there are ways in which that they really also need support from us as well. No, uh, I mean, we, I don't know if people saw today, uh, Penguin Random House and Is It Freedom to Read have actually filed suit against um, the state of Florida in terms of book banning policies. So I think the fight needs to come from a lot of folks and we need to be in cooperation with each other because exactly to your point, what we are hearing about and what we've heard about from librarians who responded to our survey is that a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes don't get reported. So the Office of Intellectual Freedom, for example, even in publishing the list of bans and challenge books, they estimate about 85% of bans and challenges are never reported. So in a lot of cases, those are the behind the scenes where maybe you do have vulnerable staff members, vulnerable communities, or even a vulnerable library situation in which folks are making the decision to quietly pull a book off the shelf, recatalog it, place it in a different section because there is a lot of worry. Um, one of the things um, that I would urge anybody listening to the webinar is if you are in a library or school and this is happening, please report it. Um, the OIF um, reporting uh, challenge form is completely anonymous. You can also report through Freedom to Read, through ACLU. It's best that we keep track of what's going on because as Strong spoke to, a lot of titles, a lot of creators, a lot of voices are getting minimized or in many cases erased from discussions. And this is a big problem with bans and challenges. Um, so we're going to go over quickly to Tia. So Tia, you spoke a little bit about um, what your library had done in terms of cross-training all the staff to respond to bans and challenges. Are there some other suggestions that were helpful for your library post-challenge or some suggestions that you have for folks on the line or even advice to your past self? Um, 
One thing I would definitely advise other libraries to have is we actually had a living Google Doc that was bookmarked on every desk that had, so our director had some talking points and we also had the collection development team contribute some talking points to that as well. And the reason why we had it as a Google Doc instead of a handout was because that way we could update it as these things came in. And one of the things that I did to be proactive about this was I, one of the biggest arguments the banners had was that this, uh, that genderqueer was in the teen section when it was not in the teen section, it was in the adult graphic nonfiction section, I plastered the word adult all over my section. So if you, all of our units at my library are about, the top of them are about eye level height for your average um, person. And if you couldn't see a sign that was directly at in front of you at your eye height, then it was just another way that we could point and be like, well, this is in the adult section, not the teen section. And sometimes that can definitely help if, say, there's a lot of miscommunication or purposeful um, misinformation going on, which is what was happening with our library with the book banners. Um, and another thing is to if you are a library or a school to kind of know who your friends are. One of the biggest advocates that we found, surprisingly enough, was actually our local newspaper because we discovered that our local newspaper was being targeted by these same people as well who were saying that a lot of their editors and their staff were publishing things that were not aligning with their interests that were fake news, for example, when they were just reporting on the local news. So we had, um, they actually ran after we discovered that we weren't the only ones. They were targeting us. They were targeting other churches in town as well. They were targeting a lot of, um, it seemed to be the LGBTQ friendly churches. And it didn't just constrain to wrong religion either. This stretched to um, our local Muslim uh, and Islam chapters. They stretched to our Hindi populations as well. So having, knowing you who your friends are and being able to mobilize them, um, especially during our board meetings, when things started to get really heated, we started to reach out and I wish we would have done that sooner because I fully believe that should, had we have done that sooner, it wouldn't have gone on for as long as it had. Um, and yeah, eventually I remember our, the local paper ended up doing three write-ups on this group, including a very scathing hit piece on their leader. And a lot of, inf they were able to find out a lot of information about his background that kind of stopped the movement in its tracks because a lot of what he was saying wasn't really agreeing with his past. So knowing who your friends are can really help you in those situations more than you would think. Uh, so we're kind of closing in on time. So uh, to kind of end this heavy discussion, we do want to end on uh, reminding people to take self-care and to think about this. So uh, Tron, I'll ask you in your bio, you mentioned tending a small flock of very spoiled hens. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can speak more about some of your animals and the impact of tending a flock uh, and especially how that affects your work and life, especially in stressful situations. Oh yes, um, so they're they're fantastic. Uh, it was not a, my my idea to get chickens. My my partner really wanted to get hens, and we live in Minneapolis. We're in the city, um, and so I didn't know that it was possible to you know keep hens in the city at all. But we were able to do it, and I was very non-committal about it. I, um, in general, just was not keen on taking care of anything with its own personality and digestive tract. That was kind of a no-go for me in general. Um, but then we got them, and they were adorable. And the first thing I did was name them and I raised them in my office before that they could survive outside and so I became very attached to them and now they're my reason to stop my work and get up from my desk and go outside and spend some time with them 
um, it's really, I mean, especially for, for comic books, which, you know, I, I write and I draw them. And so I'm sitting at my desk all of the time doing all kinds of different sorts of labor. And it becomes important to be able to have some sort of task that takes me away from from just being at my desk and that that's uh and having the hens is is really wonderful <laughs> they're uh they're very sassy they have incredibly distinct personalities and they're always sort of renegotiating their relationships with one another in ways that surprise and delight me and so um <laughs> it's wonderful to to have a pet that requires you to be outside Uh, that's wonderful. That's a great story. And like, I just picture Chicken Run, like <laughs> moving in the background, it's kind of like social dynamic. It's just great. Uh, Tia, what are some of your self-care practices, uh, especially after kind of the stress of having to confront a challenge or have someone confront you about a, a title? Well, one of the things I've always been really good at doing is funneling my frustrations into a creative medium. And something did come out of this good because of my love of comics. I actually started drawing. Um, I actually really got into drawing robots, funnily enough. And um, I actually draw a lot of Transformers now, including some of my own Transformers comics. Uh, both out of love for those comics and because I think having just they're very simple in my opinion they're very simple to draw because of their shapes um because you're not drawing a lot of rounded lines it's a lot of hard lines so you can be as rough with that as you want or you can be as soft as it with you want and plus the coloring in as well it, there is something very satisfying about it especially to get those bold colors you have to press really hard on the paper to get those out so I took up drawing. Um, I started working out as well. Uh, physical exercise is a great way, especially if you are sitting behind a desk a lot, to really get that frustration out, really get those emotions out. And uh, yeah, so I encourage to channel uh, channel something into something creative, or if you can't do that, just get up and move. Okay, that's great. Um... I think uh, we can also move on to asking um, what's coming up, what's next. Uh, we have a question in the chat for Trung. Uh, can you ask us, can you tell us anything about your next project? And maybe there's a chicken themed project in the works. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, there's not a, a chicken themed project in the works just yet, but I'm sure that will change. Um, I, I am working on my second solo graphic novel. Um, it's called Angelica and the Bear Prince. It's going to be very different from The Magic Fish in that it's just a romantic comedy. It's very self-indulgent. It's just something that I really wanted to um, throw myself into um, after The Magic Fish, which wound up being much heavier than I originally intended it to be. So I'm excited to do that. Um, I've taken on a few kind of smaller projects um, with uh, Marvel and DC Comics as well that come out very sporadically and those are very easy to find. So uh, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm working on a few more things and I'm signed on to also collaborate with two more writers that I really admire as well. So I'll be doing my first graphic novel collaborations in the future really soon. Okay, that's great. Uh, Tia, do you have any plans coming up? Anything exciting? Um, I'm actually going to be attending Gen Con. Uh, if anybody knows um, about anything board games, it is the biggest board game convention in the country. So I'll be attending that in August. And um, coming up in my library as well to further bridge the gap between um, my adult manga readers and regular adult fiction, I'm actually currently working on introducing a light novel section. And for people who don't know what light novels are, is they are a medium that has been in Asia for a really long time and is now starting to see some resurgence in the West, where a lot of them almost read like mangas, but they are traditionally prose books, but a lot of them are set in the manga and anime universes that we know and love. So Death Note, for example, has a light novel. Um, Attack on Titan has several light novels. So I'm really looking forward to bringing that to our readers, and I'm hoping that certain groups don't notice because it's a new thing and change is scary um but i believe that for those readers it's going to be a really exciting time and a lot of our staff seem to be interested in it too so i'm hoping that our readers advisory is going to improve with this new and exciting medium so fun 
Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I'm excited for, <laughs> for both of you, future plans. Um, Gabe, is there anything that you can talk about that's coming up for you? Uh, yes, I am very excited. Uh, I will be attending ALA. Uh, I did win the GNCRT travel grant to attend. And uh, I actually just had a meeting with my director, uh, who's both very excited and just a little bit jealous that I get to go to ALA. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to be working on that uh, and planning that uh, coming up. Um, I will not be able to attend Gen Con, but I am a <laughs> Uh, I am a lifelong, the, not a lifelong, but a DD and d player. Uh, I play several games, so I'm excited for the critical role announcements uh, and the Derek and Press to come out of Gen Con. So, um, and I'm working on plans to incorporate uh, graphic novels and comic books into the university curricula and getting the faculty behind using uh, comic books in their classroom. So, yeah, there's a lot of little things kind of simmering, but uh, I'm so excited to attend ALA. I cannot wait. Yeah, I should say uh, Gabe is one of our two winners for our newly implemented comics librarianship travel grant. So it is sort of first of its kind and it's um, a large amount of money for people to actually attend ALA because we know that professional development is very cost prohibitive for a lot of folks. Uh, for people who are joining us at ALA annual, so on Friday, June 23rd, the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable is hosting our annual Friday Forum. So it's a full day of events all around comics programming in libraries. We have one session on graphic medicine and one on addressing bans and challenges. And you knew and unusual this year, we only have two panels because each of our panels are going to be followed by a workshop. So if you attend the graphic medicine panel and then you have questions on building or working with graphic medicine, we'll have a workshop about that. For our dressing bands and challenges, we'll have a panel and then we'll have a workshop afterwards. So even very pragmatically, if you have a collection development policy or a challenge policy that you want us to look at and offer advice with, we can talk through that. If you're dealing with a banner challenge, we are here to help. Um, so that will be Friday, June 23rd, um, coming up during ALA annual. Um, I just want to double check if we have any other questions that have come through from our audience. Um, so I think we're at about three minutes, but Trungar Tia, is there anything else? Um, if, did you have any questions for us? We're so thankful that you both could join us today and talk about this. It's a very challenging topic but I think it's an important one to talk about. And we also wanna show everybody on the line or who's watching this later through a recording that we can fight the challenges and we can live to library another day or to create another day. And I think that's the most important thing is that these things have happened before and they'll happen again and we can actually get through them. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. I'm just really encouraged and enlivened to have had this discussion with um, all of you. All the things that I'm learning from um, both you and Gabe and Tia um, have been really uh, just, I, I feel, you know, I feel galvanized. I feel excited yeah. to, you know, go to my public library and talk to some librarians and check out what my resources are. Oh, awesome. Thanks so much. And Tia, is there anything you want to add as we sign off? Uh, yes, if there is one thing that I want to say to everyone who is watching this or is part of this panel or is watching this in the future, it is no matter where you are in the book industry, we are a public librarian, a school librarian, an educator, an advocate, or even an author or an illustrator, never apologize for doing your job. Never apologize because we are we are in this profession because we love the medium. We are in this profession because we want to help people. And that is all we are trying to do. We are not going after anybody. So never apologize for doing your job. Gabe, any signing off words? Uh, yeah, just remember we're in this together. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that can help people prepare and the library community, one of our greatest strengths is that we love to share resources, we love to share information, and that means including with each other. So, uh, you know, reach out and you'll find your community and you will find uh, partners. Yeah. And to everybody who's joined us today, to our panelists, thank you so much. 
Um, for everyone who is either attending or will watch this live, uh, we will have um, the recording of the video up. We will also have a corresponding resources document. So anything that was dropped into chat, any of the links or information our panelists share that will all go in our resources document. And we also have up on our website video from um, webinars one and two. So before a challenge, during a challenge, and now we have after a challenge. But again, if you're able, please join us in Chicago um, for our workshop and panel on addressing bans and challenges. And there'll be lots more to come. And just as we say, um, live to library another day and you're not alone in this. Thanks so much, everyone. We're gonna sign off for now.